All right, so we're going to start with our first topic, uh, the last topic in the course, okay, uh, which is basically what the essentially what the market refers to. The industry refers to this as swaps, okay, and so essentially it covers interest rate and currency swaps, okay, and so uh, there, there's a problem with the terminology that is used in industry, but I won't have time to address all that in great detail. I'll just give you a brief flavor of what the problem is and what the uh, correct taxonomy should be, but essentially what we are going to cover today is the uh, what the industry refers to as interest rate swap interest rate swaps and currency swaps so this is written as interest rate and currency swaps essentially what that means is this is to be read as interest rate swaps and currency swaps okay so you can use this I've given this in your notes as a reference this is your um, page six of this book which is in your finance reference maybe from your IPM um, IPM uh, folder all right so let's first understand the broad classification what uh, I have done up your notes also a little bit I will be um, okay so let's go to your note on swaps is this is the one on swaps no this is the case all right this is your note on swaps we need to reduce the zoom a little bit all right so what we are starting with is the I'll just give you a brief flavor of this is your technical note on swaps which again relates to the case why do we relate to the case first let's connect back to the case so that we can understand what the problem is so I've actually added a question to the case so if you look at your case we have discussed questions one two three okay now 4.1 I've actually added a new question 4.3 so there are three questions here and then there's a fourth question here 4.1 to 4.3 is three questions plus there's a fourth question number five all of these questions relate to the use of interest rate and currency swaps okay which the market in general refers to as swap swaps so because of this this is why we need the technical note on swap so this case is a little unusual from what you compared to what you've usually done so this case is structured as first you have a technical note you have a whole bunch of technical notes right so you're supposed to read the technical first you're supposed to read the case read the questions in the case then go back to read the technical note and then all the technical notes and then come back and try to answer the questions in the case that's how it works and then this case has another uh, unusual third part which is your trading project which is your risk management project using live data right so there you are trying to actually put into place a, a, a real life hedging program based on real life market movements right so if we can see what is going on let's see what the oil price is doing you saw what the Iranian reaction was uh, you notice what they did they didn't hit the they didn't kill anyone yes sir. so they these guys were able to strike with such so this is basically a, a, a PR uh, missile attack because they were so precise in hitting the Saudi oil fields they have look at this now look at what happened to the oil price I was discussing yesterday that this was going to peak down fall down from here itself but it made one more high after the missile attack was launched now it's fallen because they know there's not going to be escalation see what the Iranians have done is this is a PR missile attack because these guys who can hit the Saudi oil facilities with such precision they deliberately hit the miss uh, bases it's in such a way that nobody got killed and there was no major casualty just to show that we are heading back and then they said in the note the the uh, foreign minister said that we have responded and concluded our response so concluded is key which means we are not going to do anything more so basically what this has happened is contrary to what the whole world this is why you should not trust the media and the so-called experts when Trump killed that guy everybody said oh my god World War three is gonna break what has actually happened is because he took such a drastic step of killing and he waited for a long time because he took such a drastic step the Iranians have now got scared now they're backing off now they're backing off saying that you know I'm just going to hit your like like this I'm just gonna hit you. just like now please don't hit back I'm just gonna hit you like this to show that I'm hitting him you know just to show my population that I'm doing a PR missile attack okay so this is the story so you have to understand all geopolitical events also in this manner don't just trust what the media tells you right okay so you're gonna manage this this is the kind of problem that you have to deal with when you're actually managing a hedge book which is the third part of your case where you're actually managing a, a hedge portfolio trying to minimize your total loss right are you getting the point so this is the structure of the case all right so so let's go back to this so what we're going to look at first is your notes yeah. 
yeah then you know so what I've done is so uh, let's understand the industry terminology how people use the term swap in the industry they use the term swap in two contexts they will either say swaps or they will say FX swaps okay and there are some problems with this I'll just give you a brief idea on that but let's understand what the what they mean first what the industry means when it says swaps is it's referring to interest rate swaps and currency swaps which you can see here also that when this uh, the in this book you can see swaps fall into two broad categories okay interest rate swaps and currency swaps okay this is what the industry means when they are talking about swaps and when they are talking about FX swaps they are talking about a different kind of instrument okay which is you have already seen that instrument that but the point uh, so so this is basically what the industry terminology is so swaps is used in the industry in two ways FX swaps in two contexts FX swaps and swaps when they say swaps they mean interest rate swaps and currency swaps for the case for, for the purposes of our case we will be only discussing interest rate swaps and currency swaps but you need to be aware that there's another term that is why I've said that you need to be careful because there is another term called FX swaps which is used in the industry which is a totally different instrument from these interest rate swaps and currency swaps so you have to be a little careful so uh, and these FX swaps you have already seen I'll just briefly talk about FX swaps you have already seen the structure of the FX swap I'm not going to go into the detail of the FX swap but you have already seen the structure because remember we have discussed two transactions the bond repo we have discussed bond repos yes remember we have discussed bond repos in the class maybe you were sleeping but uh, we have discussed bond repos in the class in great detail right it is written in your notes in your calc spreadsheet as well okay bond repos are discussed where you sell and buy you sell the bond and buy it back when you send the bond and buy it back at the uh, at the far date on the far date near date you sell and by far date you buy back okay so this is the same structure the generic transaction structure which we have discussed is buy sell base asset this is also in your futures notes okay try to understand the structure which we have already discussed in the case of the repo so you have to see when you see a particular transaction like a repo you have to also see the general features of that transaction so when you see the particular transaction and then you sort of zoom out to 30,000 feet and then you see the general structure of the transaction what is happening in general in a repo if you take the bond as the base asset you are selling the bond in the near date remember we have this uh, uh, structure in your um, in your notes in your calc file I think when we looked at um, I don't know where exactly we covered it maybe it was um, no it won't be here I guess uh, it won't be here maybe in future spreads somewhere we covered no I don't think we came here these are all future spreads which you can also look at which we have also discussed the same you remember the basic structure in your um, in your mind keep this basic structure in your mind I think maybe we covered it here yeah this is the repo what is happening in the repo same structure general structure I should not be repeating this because it's already been done remember there's a general first understand the general structure it's not complicated to understand the general structure that we are applying you will be taking a base asset there will be a near date and a far date it's same one transaction it's not two transactions one transaction with two legs there will be a near date and a far date okay could be anything as long as the near date is before the far date near date and far date there will be a base asset and a terms asset and any market transaction so in the near date you are going to either sell the base asset if you are selling in the near date you are going to buy in the far date if you are buying in the near date you are going to sell on the far date and on the near date if you are selling the base asset then you are buying the terms asset automatically follows you don't have to remember anything all you need to remember in a general repo transaction the general form of a repo transaction is that there are there's one transaction with two legs near date and far date and obviously there has to be a base asset and terms asset in any market right so therefore in the whatever you do to the base asset in the near date buy or sell opposite has to be done on the far date and then whatever you're doing to the base asset in the near date or the far date you're doing the opposite to the terms asset if you're buying on any given date if you're buying if you're buying here minus bonds this will be per plus dollars okay we have not uh, mentioned the this is the lender side My, we have not mentioned the plus dollars because if you're minus if you're doing this in India then it will be plus Indian rupees okay there will be a there has to be a terms asset in every market right 
so you will sell if in this particular case you're selling from we are looking at it from the borrower's perspective for the repo we are selling the base asset therefore we have to be buying the terms asset here the we look at a us dollar transaction so buy, we are buying dollars buying dollars is the same as taking a loan because when you take a loan the money comes into your account so buying dollars then on the far date you have to pay back the thing this has already been done you can go back and check you were not paying attention in the class so this has already been done because then in the near date what are you doing you are going to do reverse of this if you have sold bonds in the near date you will have to buy back dot bonds in the near you have to buy back bonds here you already shown here the dollars already shown here i forgot that see this is the dollars you're selling the bonds you're getting hundred dollars plus and then when you're buying back the bonds you're buying back at 105 because this five represents the interest this is how the interest is factored in by adjusting the far date price so are you seeing this transaction this is a specific level transaction but now also see the general form of the transaction you have a base you have two one transaction two legs near date far date in uh, near date whatever you're doing to the base asset you're reversing that on the other side so once you remember there's one transaction two legs in one market all you need to remember about the general form of the transaction is one market one transaction two legs and as soon as you have one market like somebody was asking i think ritesh was asking whether uh, dollar against swiss uh, is different from swiss against dollar no it's the same because the two assets are the same right so whether BG, he was asking about cable actually whether gbp usd is the same as usd gbp the market remains the same so the moment you remember one market you should call back your definition of a market exchange of two assets so one market means two assets remain fixed so here is bonds and dollars later it could be in the case of futures it could be futures contracts in different months remember this is also a futures uh inter-month spread same thing will happen in a future into one stream so you can see what is so understand the general structure you are doing something to the base asset reversing in the in the far date that's it so one market one transaction two legs moment you remember this everything falls into place and obviously you have to reverse near date and far date can't be the same transaction it has to be the opposite that's with opposite transaction clear this is the basic structure so all i'm going to tell you now about foreign exchange swaps is that the foreign exchange swap is going to have the same generic transaction structure when you were not going to cover it in detail but if you cover it later i've given you a link to for foreign exchange swaps this is a very useful uh, link actually uh, you can click it later and see i don't know if this opens but you can read this for foreign exchange swaps uh, this is a very useful site wiki treasurers for those who are interested in corporate treasury risk management everyone every finance student should be reading all this stuff okay so whatever the F the fx swap is going to have the same structure so the the insight that you have here which you will not which is generally not emphasized in industry i've never seen it emphasized anywhere that you have to understand that the transactions are the same there are three different transactions fx swap bond repo and futures intermont spread you've also done futures intermont spread how have you done futures intermont spreads remember when we did the stack and roll hedge when we did the stack and roll hedge what did we see you remember the stack and roll hedge where you keep on rolling your total hedge sell march by april sell april by may those are futures intermont spreads because what is happening oil okay market remains the same oil so base asset is oil terms asset is us dollars you are selling oil for april and buying it for may if you are selling in april that means you are buying dollars in april then if you are buying it for may then you are selling dollars for may same structure okay so the insight that i am giving you okay which is uh, unique to this course which is that these three transactions are all the same these three different transactions which are usually discussed differently in the markets they are actually identical in terms of structure futures intermont spreads bond repos and fx swaps we are not covering fx swaps in detail because we don't have the time but when we in the context of our discussion of swaps market uses two terms which swaps in it one is swaps referring to interest rate and currency swaps second is fx swaps and what are fx swaps although we don't discuss in detail you already know the general structure of an fx swap it is going to follow this rule you will be one market two dates uh, one transaction two day uh, two legs okay this is what is given here okay buy sell base terms asset near date versus far put a comma here 
okay buy sell based terms i said near date versus far date put another comma here a uh, semicolon here okay generally at different prices all right so this is the basic structure so you already have some idea about an fx swap because you have seen two identically structured transactions you have seen the bond repo and you have also seen the futures intermont spread what were we doing in the futures intermont spread when we were looking at all these crude oil prices if you're a uh, let's say you're hedging uh, crude oil for uh, your heading hedging jet fuel using crude oil futures for let's say Ryanair you have a bunch of positions in February then some whatever is not being picked up okay additional uh, leftover amounts you are selling uh, you, you are uh, buy you would have brought if you're an airline if you're hedging for an airline you would have bought crude oil futures as a hedge because your underlying position is short so your hedge portfolio you would have bought a long position in crude oil maybe you would have bought say 500 contracts but only 20 contracts are being picked up in this month okay you are taking delivery so 20 so now you're left with 480 contracts so what you're going to do is 480 contracts you will be selling in uh, you're already long so you'll have to sell in february and buy in march so 480 contracts you're buying you're selling feb buying march that's an intermonth future spread uh, futures intermonth spread intramarket moment we say intermonth is sometimes you can have intermarket and intermonth but that's unusual so we right now we just focus on intramarket intermonth market is not changing again same structure you can put this into the same structure go back and see same thing you're selling and buying or buying and selling okay one near date against far date okay is this clear futures intermont spread you have already discussed it in the case of hedging right in, your, in the case of managing your hedge book okay so the point is here this this is the important insight that you should have this clear in your head that in when you go into industry people might discuss these con transactions separately but in your head it should be clear that these are actually identical in structure absolutely identical 100 percent identical in structure these three transactions fx swaps bond repos and futures intermont spreads okay and you can see for yourself how they're identical so having done that now we are going to go into because in our case we don't really deal with we don't have any question on fx swaps so now i'm going to go into the discussion of but we do have questions on interest rate swap and currency swaps. so now i'm going to go into a discussion of interest rate and currency swaps. is this clear okay all right so i'm not going to spend time on what would be the i've written briefly about what would be the right taxonomy but you can just ignore it for the moment that uh, when we are talking about swaps this swap sheet and capital market swaps are the same the proper taxonomy would be this okay this interest so you know that there are two types of transactions in in in, in the what in what the market refers to this is the industry terminology okay so i put it here okay this is the industry terminology that the market refers to swap using swaps in in, in two broad contexts fx swaps and swaps and swaps covers interest rate swaps and currency swaps but according to me these should be called capital market swaps and these fx swaps should be actually called position maturity altering swaps it's a big name but that's what it does if you see all these three transactions bond repo futures intermont spread what it does is it alters the position maturity like in here you had a position maturing in february you used a swap to alter the maturity you understand what is maturity settlement date i had a settlement date some 480 contracts in february i didn't want that settlement date i want to push it forward so what did i do i did a futures intermont spread Fed, sell feb by may sell feb by may sorry march. sell feb by march okay sell feb by march okay that's a generic uh, i mean that's a futures intermont spread okay has the same structure as a future fx swap or a bond repo and i have altered the maturity of my transaction it was a feb maturity now i made it a march maturity okay so all these transactions the reason i call it i don't want to spend too much time on this and this is not really i'm not going to make this part of your syllabus because you need to understand other aspects of taxonomy and all that but this is the right taxonomy later on maybe someday i can explain to you but this is the right book this would be the right taxonomy but you don't worry about it so much you just keep track of what the industry uses and these are the two terms that the industry will use okay and you should just remember that this is the same fx swap same as bond repos and futures intermont spreads same structure okay and you can read up on it using the hyperlink i've give, given you right now now we'll come to understanding interest rate swaps and currency swaps okay so let's understand the broad structure the bro uh, let's understand it from here i think it'll be visually easier to understand 
IRS, IRS is a term, in future I'm not going to say interest rate swaps, okay? IRS is a term that is used in industry for interest rate swaps, okay? So, what is the broad structure here? What is the broad rule for classifying something as a currency swap or calls, uh, using, I'm now just using industry terminology, okay? What is the broad rule? If there's one currency, they call it interest rate swap. And if there's two currencies, we call it a currency swap, okay? So, essentially what you have is, uh, you don't worry so much about the definition. Just look at an example of a currency swap or a, 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 a interest rate swap. Then you'll get an idea. Okay. But understand this broad classification. First, let's get the broad classification out of the way. And then once we have the broad map, then we will proceed through each of the transactions. So let me first give you the broad map. So the broad map is an interest rate and currency interest rates for IRS and currency swaps. If it's one currency, okay, there'll be two, there'll be a, a two, two uh, flows, okay, in the transaction. If it's one currency, then it's called an IRS. If it is uh, two currencies, it's called a currency swap. Now within IRS, there'll be two varieties fixed floating okay and floating floating this is all in your notes okay it's in your swaps notes or also on the capital market swaps this is in your calc file so in irs there'll be two subdivisions you can see all this it's also written here instead of taking notes maybe i mean i don't want to discourage people from taking notes but it's all given in this book also okay you can read it it's all well explained in this book okay i'd say rather you try to focus on understanding because the notes are all here whatever you need is all here okay so here you can see interest rate swaps everyone can read this is the font clear middle bigger i don't think i can change let me see if i can do anything about the contrast is it better it's better then can we make it a little bit bigger here i don't know if this, this 25 will help does help does it should i make it 30 We'll move the screen around. Is it better? Yes. Okay. Very good. Okay. So all of what all we are saying, this is just English language, and here I am uh, using just graphical, uh, broad, uh, rough, shorthand kind of stuff. On IRS, there'll be two broad splits. There'll be a floating, floating, and there'll be a fixed floating. Okay. So and in on the currency swap side there will be three variations here there will be two variations so once you remember the scheme you don't even have to remember much because you can automatically reconstruct it okay once you know that there are fixed floating uh, two different legs one is fixed and floating and one is floating and then because you have two currencies now you will have a third leg so here is this fixed floating is the same as the irs fixed floating and here also floating floating is the same but here you can have one more variation because you can have fixed fixed because you have two different currencies so there'll be one fixed in sterling and one fixed in aussie okay so there'll be two different flows which you can't have on the interest rate swap side with only one currency so fixed dollar against fixed dollar makes no sense right okay now let's see the basic structure of a uh, of an interest rate swap then you'll understand all swaps will have this basic structure okay so here the whatever i showed you graphically in terms of broad scheme this is just given to you in the english language here you can read all this stuff i'm not going to repeat it okay Fixed floating, floating fixed. Doesn't matter how you call it. Okay, whether it's GBP, USD or USD, GBP, the market is the same. So fixed floating, floating fixed, same. Okay, so one floating rate and one fixed rate. Okay, when you see the diagram, you'll see. And basis swaps, okay, these are called basis swaps, which have floating rates on both legs. So this is all written here in your notes, okay, in, in, the, in this book. And then currency swaps, you'll have three varieties. These are all the names, okay, which um, let's, before seeing the names, let's look at the basic structure of an interest rate swap, okay. So you can see here anyway, so we'll just briefly go through. Cross currency IRS, okay, so sometimes you just write it as cross is written with an X and currency is written as CC y so you'll have x ccy irs that means cross currency interest rate swap the shorthand okay sometimes these are called um, so you have cross currency irs means they're going to be two currencies and they're going to be two types of rates floating and fixed so one will be fixed in gbp maybe one will be fixed in us dollars and one will be floating in us dollars so we'll see all these variations we're just giving the broad map initially then there's uh, fixed and fixed to fixed currency swaps which is the same as synthetic forward it's a synthetic forward fx contract which we will not go into this why this is called a synthetic forward fx but two currencies but one type of interest rate fixed rate if you read this the uh, this book it will give you a good idea okay cross currency basis swaps same thing 
two currencies one type of interest uh, interest rate both are floating rates okay so these are called cross currency basis swap these are all what i've used here is these are all industry terminology okay so uh, this is all industry terminology that i've used circus swap so this is good for you because before you uh, ideally would have had time to teach you everything but at this point at least you know what the industry terminology is and you know the terms okay so now you know the broad map so this is a good way to visually remember the broad map so uh, swaps when the market is referring to swap is talking about irs and currency swaps on irs there'll be variations fixed floating and floating floating and on the currency swaps there will be the same variations in irs fixed floating 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 plus there are additional variation which is fixed fixed two different currencies so after all this lecture which is non-visual now let's go to the actual visual of a particular uh, let's see if we can see a, again the thing has to be changed okay now let's look at the swap okay now let's look at the swap now this part here is the swap okay so here we are showing this because this book was written for corporate hedges so everything is related to hedging how so when we are studying these products okay so that when you study derivative products there are actually three uh, we can study it in three parts this is just my view that first you understand the product features then you understand the product applications and then you understand the pricing the pricing is the least important for applicate for, for hedges because you can do the applications without uh, knowing how the pricing is done as long as you're dealing with market prices and pricing is more complex to understand and some of the pricing really doesn't make a lot of sense like option pricing which is kind of uh, quite useless okay so let's understand the basic structure of a swap okay we can also use uh, maybe this and i've also referred to you the referred to you okay let's understand this a little bit better can you see this clearly you can see the structure clearly i'll try to raise it okay if i raise it it goes up beyond so this is the basic structure so I, it's better to show you in isolation you have an interest rate swap and all swaps are going to have this basic structure again remember always when you see a particular transaction also also you should be working in your head all the time to see if there's any generalities which you can apply to other situations just like fx swaps bond repos and futures intermont spreads are actually the same general structure okay so here the general structure of any swap irs or currency swap the general structure is always going to be with this there'll be two counterparties which is kind of obvious if you have a market transaction because remember swap is a type of instrument so it's going to be traded in a market okay with respect to a market so here you know, this instrument so there are going to be two counterparties okay so here what you have is this is the basic structure of any swap there will be two counterparties one guy will be paying something to the other guy and he will be receiving something else from the other guy and all we are doing with these all these variations of five variations of swaps okay all we are doing is we are playing with what is happening here these you can think of these as types of interest rate this three percent is a fixed interest rate LIBOR is a floating interest rate yes okay now this is a US dollar uh, based interest it is a US dollar IRS okay so therefore only is only one currency but what you can vary here so the basic structure of the swap is going to be like this there are going to be two counterparties one guy is paying something and both the both the counterparties are paying something and receiving something else and what you're paying and what you're receiving these are the two legs of the swap okay we refer to these as the legs of the swap so when we say so when you want uh, so it's very simple so you don't have try not to memorize stuff remember just the basic structure there are two counterparties and there are flows okay these are periodic flows like if this is a five-year interest rate swap there may be a flow every three months every three months this three month LIBOR every three months we find out what is three month LIBOR okay or what was the fixing previous three months ago and then then you have to pay the LIBOR to the Citigroup pays the LIBOR to the Apple Apple pays three percent so LIBOR fixing may be anything it could be 1.7 it could be 4.6 okay but whatever happens Apple pays only three percent because that is fixed what Citibank pays is not fixed because that is LIBOR so it keeps getting maybe six month LIBOR three month LIBOR so it'll keep getting fixed six months every six months or every three months okay so is this clear so if you look at the if you look at the specific transaction you can see but when you want to start looking at the general structure of the transaction what is it there are two counterparties and each counterparty is paying out something and receiving something those are we can call them flows those are periodic flows okay generally a swap will have periodic flows we're not talking about if you see here 
I don't want to go back. But essentially, you'll see in the definitions also so that. Yeah, you can write it like that. You, I've given you a uh, detailed definition, but don't try to memorize it. Just for your understanding, the definition is written in such a way. Just for your understanding, down below I've given a detailed uh, definition here. Okay, which is two parties agree to exchange interest flows. I don't want to get you into this so uh, detailed language here. It becomes confusing. Then you start get memorizing. But I think it's better to understanding it, uh, understand it from a visual perspective. Basic structure of a swap is always going to be two counterparties and each counterparty will be receiving some flow and paying some flow right so now how can you play with these flows you can play with the flows by changing interest rate fixed and floating you can change the type of interest rate and you can change the currencies you can only have two currencies because there are only two legs okay so you can only have currency and these are periodic flows this is what you have to remember which is not apparent from this then you have to draw this periodically visually you can draw the same thing for you know every three months you draw this bit same picture to get the full picture of the transaction but the idea here is that it's a periodic flow is this clear yes, the basic structure two counterparties i each counterparty is receiving a flow and paying a flow now what is the nature of those flows you can change the interest rate type from fixed to floating you can play with that and you can change the currency because every flow every payment in the world wherever you are has to be in some currencies it's some currency or the other right so you can play with the currency right so that's what we have done if you go back to your broad scheme what did we do here that's what we did once you have the visual picture of the main interest rate and i've tried to draw, draw something here same kind of thing if we can bring these closer if there is anything here can we delete this row yeah we can delete this row Okay, and uh, let's try and bring this. We can see it in one view. Okay, I think now we can see it in one view. Can you still read this? Yeah, okay. So all we are doing is, we are playing, how do we come up with these things? You just visually remember this, that there are two counterparties always, and there are each counterparty is paying receiving something and paying something if we look at it from stan chart's point of view right so now what are you paying you could play with that you can make it a fixed interest rate or you can make it a floating interest rate you can make it currency one currency two in this case this is just a irs this is the first variation this is just the i this is just the fixed floating irs okay so what you have here is basically the fixed floating irs we can write this as a fixed floating irs all right so this is what we would call it fixed floating floating fix whatever you want to call it so this is what you have this is a fixed floating irs because both are happening in currency one but you can clearly see that the two things you can play with are you can play with the nature type of interest flow floating or fixed you can play with the currency you can make both are currency one or one is currency one one is currency two and then you'll automatically come up with these variations okay so here we can actually go through uh, this is, these are not very pretty but this is the basic idea some of these i've not changed okay i've just copied them i've not changed it you don't need to refer to all these diagrams here because you can refer to the book okay so what you're seeing now what you saw over there you can see here if we go back to our full zoom if we go back to our full zoom now you can see it here okay two parties agree remember interest rate an irs is a contract so there's an agreement okay and it's enforceable so two parties two parties okay exchange interest flows you're exchanging i'm paying you some flow and you're paying me some flow okay with uh, quantum and currency of interest amount flow amount bit determined according to two different rules or methods this is a fancy way of writing that one is fixed and one is one could be fixed one could be floating but the point is two different rules or methods you can have also two different floating rates you can have one rate being uh, fixed i've shown you one of these uh, variations but let's just go through the definition here predetermined principal amount all these details come in because if i'm going to pay you three percent three percent on what 100 million 2 million 5 dollars 
three percent on what the moment you say percentage automatically you have to understand that there has to be some principle otherwise there can't be any percentage right so there's obviously a principal amount that has to be specified all right and uh, or diff uh, on different principal amounts linked by the spot FX rate you can have two currencies okay on two or more interest settlement dates so to have a swap to have a swap in this sense you need to have at least two settlement dates that means you need to have at least two dates on which there are flows if it's only one date then it won't be a swap we'll call it something else okay we'll call it an fra or all that you can read about all these instruments here you can read for your own benefit you can read this entire uh, this is a more technical book okay but this is explaining everything in a very simple way the entire range of interest rate and currency hedging options that are available including all exotic products but they're all explained in a simple non-mathematical way with graphs you can cover all this stuff as i said this book is still 100 percent relevant because it deals with product features and product features haven't changed if you do an irs today even today the structure is the same okay so uh so what was i saying where where, where did we go interested so if you have so you can read about fras even even in this book as well you will see fras mentioned okay fra is a forward rate agreement so the important thing to understand is that in order for it to be a swap there have to be at least two or more interest settlement dates okay which means this flow that is exchanged it has to be at least done on two dates otherwise it's not a swap okay and usually it is much more than two dates usually you have long swaps like five years ten years okay so every three months you have a five-year dollar dollar irs against three month libor so that means you'll have like four you'll have 20 settlement dates right because each year there are four settlement dates because three month libor is getting fixed four times every year so there are four into five 20 settlement dates so usually those are the kind of numbers you're looking at usually long-term interest rate. but technically for the definition just like when we define time series data remember what did we say at least one variable time series data definition for at least two points of time right why did we say? normally when you look at time series data is it just two points of time like this time series not two points of time but you need at least two points of time minimum so when you are writing a definition you have to write it in a very technical way so that even a data series with 3.3 data points or two data points is technically still a time because this is how a computer will want to know it you can't write loose definitions for computers so when i write a definition i always think of i am writing a definition for a computer and computers will want to know in this highly specific way that a computer will throw it at you and say okay wow well, now i have a data series with two day two observe two points of time is this a time series or not it is actually a time series technically because it's got at least two times of it has shown the passage of time change in value over passage of over a period of time this is clear okay so that's why we say at least two periods of time okay so what was i covering we were looking at the definition are you guys following so far yeah okay all right uh, so over a period of time two uh, two or more interest rate over a period of time like five years ten years seven years three years whatever okay so now because it's uh, now this you can read from your uh, um, uh, hull book this is actually copied from the hull book which is that this is that these swap transactions are done under a particular type of agreement it's called a isda master agreement okay it's a you see all this mentioned in the uh, in their textbook in the hull textbook so this is an example of a confirmation we're not going to go too much into it because it's the legal aspect of it we don't have time for it uh, we have to focus on the product features the market related product features what it does how the flows are structured and all that and how we're going to apply it to the case okay so you read all this stuff i'll i'll delete this uh, the rest of the uh, thing but mainly you have to focus on the swap structure once again you see another swap between intel and microsoft you see the general structure is followed two counterparties each is receiving a flow and paying a flow and the nature of interest rate the nature of the interest rate is varying one is a fixed rate one is a floating rate okay if both are floating rates then it will be a, a different kind of floating rate it won't be a it won't be a uh, the same it won't be libor to libor we'll show you some of those so here is a classical example of how so you are familiar with the stop structure now basic structure of a swap so now let's look at how an interest rate swap is covered all this stuff is given here all the details are in this book you can read it later okay but look so first you have a borrower because this is one of the questions in the case right one of the questions in the case is 
so one let's say let's deal with say question number five okay the law dollar loan has a five-year maturity and it's at LIBOR yeah three month LIBOR so there is is there some risk on this loan unfortunately because we are so tight on time we don't even have time to have a proper case discussion but there is an interest rate risk on this loan because it's five years you can have like only the first interest payment is known when you start the loan because that day's LIBOR you can see two days earlier when you have the drawdown before that two days earlier LIBOR that will apply to the payment you make after three months okay because LIBOR is fixed in advance and paid later similarly as to an FD when you put an FD in a bank for three months you know the interest rate you're going to get today itself but you're not getting it right now you'll get it after three months okay so most of the interest payments work like this generally the setting is done before and after the period you get your payment okay generally but if it's a very long then you can ask for quarterly if it's like you're putting a five-year deposit you can ask for quarterly compounding and pay the interest into your account and all that those are com more complicated structures but generally okay so here you have interest rate risk because over five years LIBOR can really shoot up remember we have seen the flows of interest rates if you look at this is just 10 year US Treasury movement but if you have uh, if you look at LIBOR you will see LIBOR also varies pretty much in the same way this is US 10 year treasuries how it's moving around if you look at a LIBOR chart I don't want to waste the time look out for a LIBOR chart over here but you can do it on your own if you do the exercise if you go to the same website and then you'll see that LIBOR pretty much also varies in the same way a lot of variation is possible so over five years LIBOR could shoot up today's LIBOR maybe one 1.7 but maybe in after one year's time LIBOR is already shot up to four and a half who knows what can happen so then you might have a huge uh, unanticipated rise in your interest costs because you're paying interest according to three month LIBOR are you clear yes. this is clear so this is what we are showing here that when you have ABC which ABC is the same as magma resources in this case because they have a floating rate loan so what do they have to pay every six this is a six month LIBOR and ours is three month LIBOR doesn't make a difference okay it's the same floating rate problem because you have a long-term loan with six month resets so there'll be many many resets within the time of the term of the loan this is clear okay so just ignore six months and treat it as three months in our example so you see here this is the same problem for magma because every three months they're paying rates to their lender they are paying us uh, interest rate to the lender and they don't know what the uh, payment will be except for the first setting except for the first payment they know at the beginning of the loan but the other payments they don't know so there is an interest rate risk here they are exposed that's why we said when we looked at the key risk factors the other question in the case in the very beginning when we looked at the balance sheet when we looked at your magma balance sheet remember if we look uh, pull up that note uh, in this case one of the key risk factors we mentioned is not obviously apparent on the balance sheet but you have to you can see it once you read the terms once you read the details of the case you can see the details that this USD loan is on a floating rate that is mentioned in the case so therefore that increases your risk factor you have another risk factor which you can't clearly see from here which is once you know what this what kind of loan this is you are exposed you are short your underlying position is the KRF is actually three month LIBOR three month dollar LIBOR is the KRF okay and the underlying position in the three month dollar LIBOR is short because you will lose money if three month dollar LIBOR starts rising remember we had all these discussions so you have this is the problem that you see here okay you're seeing this problem here okay this is they're exposed here because if this goes up you have a problem okay so what is the question asking you the question is asking you The question is asking you based on your understanding of capital market swap structures which we'll just call it swaps okay because we are not going to use my terminology here which uh, I think is the right way to describe it uh, swaps based on your understanding of swaps uh, okay all right based on your understanding of swaps what are the possible ways to manage the interest rate risk on the US dollar loan okay let's look at one possible way one simplest possible way is 
remember when you do a hedge okay so when you're when you're looking at any kind of interest rate swap okay one of the things you can specify is whether you are paying or receiving on that swap this is again is market lingo this is also explained in this book okay that when you are paying the fixed rate when we say paying or receiving on the swap you can refer to it as paying paying the fixed rate if you want to make it more clear but one of the things you can see is when you're doing a swap when you're one of the counterparties okay when you're one of the counterparties say when you're apple when you're trying to manage your uh, risk as apple interest rate risk and you're doing a transaction with city group because city group is like a market maker in swaps so one of the things you have to specify is whether you should be paying the fixed rate or receiving the fixed rate okay or what type of flow you should be paying and what type of flow you should be receiving from your point of now let's put ourselves down we were looking at it from 30,000 feet looking at both apple and city group now let's put ourselves in apple shoes because apple wants to do this as a risk management transaction so apple has to be very clear what kind of flow do i want to pay and what kind of flow do i want to receive do i want to pay fixed interest rates if so in what currency do i want to pay floating do i want to receive floating receive fixed in what currency i should be very clear about this okay so here what they do they look at this basic interest rate swap structure okay and you can deal with any of the market counterparties so whenever you're drawing a structure for a swap this is these are called box arrow diagrams these things are called box arrow diagrams which is very pre pretty simple to understand why okay so two counterparties what kind of flow is going from whom so what does abc want to do if you go back to abc's problem now abc has a problem just like our magma has had a problem because it's got a floating rate exposure what it really wants is that remember what is the objective of hedging is to reduce uh, risk and bring certainty to cash flows remember so if you wanted to bring certainty to cash flows what is the situation you want to create do you want to be paying a floating rate you want to be paying a fixed rate okay now if under the swap if you're paying a fixed rate if you uh, if you're paying a fixed rate you should be receiving what kind of rate floating yeah what we want to receive so we what we want is what we want is we want to pay a fixed rate okay and at the same time how am i going to deal with this because i can't change remember just like un, this is all hedging con, in the in the context of hedging you can't change your underlying positions you can't go back to the lender and say can you just renegotiate my loan and make it fixed that's not going to happen you can't touch this loan agreement remember you can't touch the loan agreement underlying position just like the underlying position you can't touch the loan agreement so you have to figure out some way of using an irs or a currency swap so that even though you can't touch this effectively this this flow should be neutralized this outflow that you have of six month LIBOR this has to be neutralized by using an IRS because you can't touch this loan you can't change the terms on the loan so you have to think how can I neutralize this this flow so if I receive the floating if I receive if I do a swap in which I'm receiving six month LIBOR will it cancel out yes under the swap I'll receive six month LIBOR yes. and I will pay the same thing to this guy so I will have no net exposure so now if you see what is happening in this in this now this is the underline I'll see this properly in the context of our, our lingo what we know underlying position this is the underlying position you can see my cursor moving around this is the underlying position right this is the hedge transaction this is the hedge transaction yes objective of hedge transaction is to offset the underlying position so you have a hedge tra you have an underlying position where you don't like this feature of the underlying position you want to offset this to a hedge transaction automatically it follows that in your hedge transaction through an irs you had better be receiving this six month i bought four you have to be receiving this under the irs so that then this will cancel out this six month inflow will cancel with this outflow is this clear so you can construct your ideal irs in this way because you know that you have to cancel out this you don't want this at the same time you can't touch this structure you can't touch the loan so you have to do something else as an offset 
so that effectively you don't have a floating rate exposure is this clear are you following so this is how you structure yeah uh, ABC has uh, taken a loan from somebody yeah and he has to pay uh, interest on floating rates yeah so now ABC is providing a loan to someone who from no this is not a loan a swap is not a loan so get this very clear so a swap is not a loan a swap is just an agreement to exchange two different types of flows interest flows okay or as I said in the definition interest flows determined according to two different rules in one currency or in two different currencies it is just an agreement to exchange interest flows let's just call it that a swap is just it's not a loan it is an agreement to enter uh, I can understand why you're thinking of loan because every time we see interest rate we think of loan okay that is why if you see if you see the definition which I've given the definition I'm talking about this should actually be called I should have mentioned it actually you know what is notional have you heard this term notional notional principle have you heard this term notional notional means it's kind of not real but it is it, it's an idea notion is an idea right so it doesn't exist in reality but we just have this idea okay so that is what's meant by notional okay so notional principle amount this is an important term i should have put that in the definition okay uh, the notional principle amount so all swaps will have a notional principle amount if you see this confirmation you can't really see it here properly because the zoom is not big enough and i don't want to change the zoom but fixed rate i don't know if you can see this fixed rate notional principle usd 100 million so every can you read this so Kriti, can you read this you can't read it okay but anyway if you read it you'll see when you go to uh, business snapshot if you go to business snapshot 7.1 in your textbook you'll see that every swap confirmation is an example of a swap confirmation it will have a it will be it will mention the notional principle they will use the term notional principle it's called NPA notional principle amount okay so this is written written in your in this book also it's, it's written in this book also this is mentioned here okay notional principle so there is a notional principle but there is no loan okay so be clear that there's no loan that's why we call it notional principle if there was actually a loan we wouldn't call it notional principle okay so you're right that there should be an, uh, some reference to principle but there is no loan okay so there is just this is a swap transaction this is a derivative transaction a swap transaction okay uh, and in particular this is an irs because same currency because we don't mention two different currencies that means it's the same currency if it has been sterling one and aussie one then would have mentioned gbp and aussie if we have not mentioned then this is understood as dollars okay so are you following so you construct the hedge so you enter into a dollar irs now you see the net exposure underlying position hedge transaction hedge transaction offsets the underlying position because this inflow under the irs cancels this outflow right what is the net exposure for abc now is to pay a fixed rate is everyone clear yes so everyone is clear and your whatever you used your if you go back to your basic uh, you know if you go back to your high level uh, classification with just the visual what did you use you use this basically this is what you used you had a dollar irs you used a dollar irs because you had a dollar in dollar outflow and in the dollar out a dollar irs you what you did was you chose to receive the floating rate and pay the fixed rate so you use the fixed floating dollar irs to hedge your exposure this is clear but out of if you use floating floating what is your objective you are a hedger okay so in general your question is okay so she's asking what is why why not use floating floating okay what would be the problem with using floating floating because what is your problem right now because what is the question asking you the question is asking you what are the possible ways to in fact this should be not manage but it should be reduce or eliminate reduce or eliminate the risk on the loan because you are this whole case is basis is this whole case is focused on hedging what is the focus of hedging 
to reduce risk and bring certainty to cash flows so if you move from floating to floating you can use an interest rate basis swap okay what we have called as you can see here it's defined earlier in the book okay uh, it starts from page six it's called an interest rate basis swap if you use that there's a diagram of that also later okay but if you use that we can go to that diagram later if we see um, yeah see here is an um, example of a basis swap so if you're you're paying let's imagine you're paying three month LIBOR on the loan okay and you enter into a basis swap which is the floating floating on both legs interest rate basis swap okay now you you are paying let's imagine you're paying a three month LIBOR outflow on the underlying position or you want to hedge that so you do an interest rate basis swap where you're receiving three month us dollar LIBOR that will cancel out with the outflow here but what is your net exposure 90 day us t bill rate if your loan is over five years how many times do you think the 90 day us t bill rate is going to be reset because 90 day t bill will expire after 90 days then there'll be another t bill rate after 90 days so this is also a three month this is also a three month uh, rate essentially 90 day or 91 day triple is a three month rate so every three months this rate is also going to change because we don't know what the next 91 day bill is going to be after 91 days yeah okay so are you clear about that is this clear the problem is okay uh, just shut the door fully when you go out okay okay um, so so please remember that uh, okay so are you able to follow now you will not reduce risk you are still left with the same kind of floating risk okay maybe a little bit less than LIBOR okay but still a floating rate risk that's why this is not good from a hedging perspective it may be good from a trading perspective an active risk book speculation but here you're hedging so you want to reduce risk and bring certainty to cash flows so you must go to a net effective fixed rate which you got over here right here you got a net effective fixed rate is this clear okay okay now now let's look at another type of transaction which is important for our question over here okay <coughs> what is the other question in the case you have to be patient don't look at the clock we have time we have to cover some we have to cover all the questions in the case yeah okay good others is saying lot of time okay so we'll go 10 minutes over based on others okay all right okay guys <laughs> okay let's look at this okay let's one sec let's look at this 4.1 aussie loan i'm going to have to basically quickly cover because i want to finish this case as part of this so we're not going to do it ideally with a discussion and all that we don't have the luxury of time okay what does it say 10 year fixed rate of uh, five percent okay and aussie rates are very low low level of short term aussie interest rates okay so let's say aussie interest rates are half percent three month aussie libor is let's say half percent okay we no longer have aussie libor fixings but three month aussie fixings let's say three month aussie interest rates are three, uh, say half percent so here the treasurer is looking at this because it's got a fixed rate loan okay so what is what is the treasurer looking at let's see if we have any other borrower or issuer of s uh, cash flows floating rate borrower okay so what have we talked about here yeah okay so what this guy has got is this this is this kind of situation okay let's bring it a little bit inside now we want to understand so let's understand the problem in the case the problem in the case is this guy is saying that why should i pay five percent fixed for 10 years because short short term aussie rates are only half percent so if i do a fixed floating swap in which what this guy wants to do is something like this he's paying seven percent okay whatever five percent seven fixed rate he's paying a fixed rate which is very high this guy doesn't like it the ceo doesn't like it he's saying you do a fixed floating irs for me where i will receive fixed okay so this five and a half seven still one and a half percent difference okay but still uh, then i'm paying six month LIBOR. let's say six month LIBOR is half percent okay so then i'm paying total only two percent because here i have a five and a, i have one and a half percent deficit over here okay 
uh, and I have to pay six month LIBOR. So six month LIBOR is half percent right now. So I am paying only net up net payment is one and a half plus half, which is two percent. Are you able to follow what the CEO wants to do? Okay. See the current situation with ABC with the Aussie loan. The Aussie loan is at the fixed rate, very high fixed rate. Okay. So he's paying this fixed rate. Okay, now he doesn't like it. He's saying, Why should I pay fixed rate 7%, 5.5% when the market interest rate, short term interest rate is half percent? So he's saying, Why don't you do this kind of transaction where even if I can't get 5.5%, 7% on the interest rate on the on the fi on the fixed leg? Okay, so this is magma resources. Okay, they want to do an IRS, same structure we used before. Okay, fixed floating dollar IRS. Okay. In this case, Aussie IRS. So he's saying you do a fixed floating IRS in which I will receive this time. I'll receive the fixed rate. Earlier we were receiving the floating rate. Now he wants to use the same structure, but flip it around because you can flip it around. You can specify what you want. Okay. So he's saying you do this thing for me, and then I am left with only a net deficit of one and a half over here, compared to what I'm paying now is seven percent. Okay. But if you do this, then I have a one and a half deficit over here because I'm getting five and a half. I'm paying seven. Plus my six month LIBOR is only half percent. So my net play cost is now 2%. Are you following? So this guy is saying huge saving of interest cost. Let's do it. Okay. But as a treasurer, what is your duty to tell him? What is the problem with this rate? No certainty. Six month LIBOR is a floating rate. You have a 10 year loan on six month LIBOR in this particular case in Magma so is a three month loan, three month LIBOR. So you have 10 year into three, uh, 10 into four, 40 fixings, uh, 39 fixings, which are uncertain. Okay. So if you don't have if you over those 39 fixings, 39, three month periods, it can go up a lot. So there is no certainty. So from a prudent hedging perspective, as a hedger, as a treasurer, whose job is to help the company to reduce risk, your answer over here should be no. Is this clear? The answer here, maybe I can write it here in the case itself to make it clear. No, because objectives of hedging. Okay, you are supposed to reduce. So you are in a fixed rate. It may be high fixed rate, but it's certain cash flows. You can predict all the cash flows because it's a fixed rate. Yes, clear. That's why. Same, same logic. There's no difference in this question. This is just a repeat. Same. Okay. No, because again, you're wanting to swap from a fixed rate of two and a half, two point seven five. If you want to do something, don't do anything because it's a fixed rate. Your known, your cash flows are known, right? The objective of hedging is to bring certainty, not to open up new uncertainty, but right? If we can uh, do this for if we have in the previous case we had five years of uh, floating rates, right? Five year of fixed rate. Yeah. And the floating rate is half half a percent. So we should do that. Uh, we can uh, do the transaction from floating rate for maybe one or two years. Yeah, but, but that, save the money. no, no, that is still there, but you don't know what will happen even in one or two years. Everything is uncertain, right? So this particular environment that we have today are very, very uh, uh, certain interest rates of because of central bank policy misdirection. That's not a normal environment. So you have to learn hedging theory from a classical perspective, which is any kind of you never know what will happen. Okay, so this is no the last question here, which is very important. Okay, which we have already covered this. Okay, so this question number five, five year maturity, how do you cover it, which is basically with the USD IRS. Okay, this we already discussed the first discussion, right? Now we have to just cover this last discussion, then I'll let you go. We have six minutes, so I can cover this last one. Now, what is this question asking? You have a 10 year Aussie loan. And what is this company's magma resources? What is their balance sheet currency? Okay. US dollars. Okay. So when you go back to the balance sheet, you look at this uh, company and you see that when we I just have to reduce it. Okay. When we looked at the balance sheet and tried to identify key risk factors, one of the key risk factors we identified was uh, the Aussie dollar rate exchange rate. Okay, Aussie US exchange rate because it's in a different currency liability Okay, now what we did not spend time on discussing at that point of time is that this uncertainty applies not just to the two and a half million principal But also to all the interest rate now. This is fixed at a rate of 
Um, this is fixed at a rate of Aussie loan is at a rate of five uh, percent. Okay, so what we actually did not discuss because I didn't want to over complicate the situation for you. When you look at this balance sheet on an economic exposure basis, this is an accounting balance sheet. When you look at it from an economic exposure point of view, think about this your exposure on Aussie is not just two and a half million, it is also the let's say these are semi annual interest rate payments. So every half year you have to pay two and a half percent divided by two, okay, for into two and a two and a half million, right. You understand that P plus I has P is paid at the end, but initially you have to pay I every period, right? So all those I payments, which are fixed amounts of Australian dollars, right? Because this two and a, is a five and a half percent loan for ten years. Every six months you have an interest payment. So all those six monthly interest payments that you have to make, those are fixed amounts of Aussie dollars. But what the Aussie dollar, what the dollar cost of buying those Aussie dollars interest payment, just to pay the interest on the Aussie dollars, that is not known to you because six months later Aussie exchange rate can be totally different. So all those are also part of your economic exposure balance sheet when you are calculating the risk. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So when you have a fixed rate loan in a different currency, okay, or even a floating rate loan, the interest. So your uh, currency exposure arises not just on principal payment, but also on interest payment. This is clear. So now the question is, so therefore, this is actually an understatement of the risk. It's not just two and a half million. It's also the additional two and a half percent every year, every six months split up into two, right? right over 10 years. Are you following? Now, the question is, now let's look at this question. What is the question saying? The question is asking question from 4.3. What kind of again, let's not use the word capital market swap structures. Let's not use. Let's just say what which swap structure. Okay. Can be used to simultaneously hedge both currency and interest rate risk on this Aussie Aussie loan. Can you see now that there is actually uh, both there is a currency risk and an interest rate risk in the sense that uh, the because uh, well actually is basically uh, hedge both the uh, should not be that's called the the currency risk on hedge the hedge the currency risk on both principal and interest payments are you following what i'm saying here this is what we just explained okay the question needs to be read written like this here's the currency risk on both principal and interest payments on this loan right how can we do that okay so how do we do that yeah so what transaction are we going to use we are going to use this transaction Obviously, we have to move. We have to move from Aussie to US. We want to change our currency payment from Aussie to US. That will remove the currency risk. And we have to change our. We should we go to floating rate US or fixed rate US? Fixed rate. Fixed rate because we have to remove risk. So what we have to do is this transaction. Fixed fixed currency swap Aussie into US. Okay. So let's see if we have any such transaction here. It must be described here somewhere. Um, Maybe um, yeah, that is derived described under currency swaps. Okay, yeah, this is what we want to do. This is showing our currency. So let's refer to page fifteen. Let's refer this to page fifteen. Um, Answer on this one is fixed fixed currency swap AUD against USD. Okay, so the structure is going to be look. I'm going to just going to say that you look at RMS. RMS is the name of this book, Risk Management Solutions. I'm just going to refer you to the diagram here. It is page number 15. Okay, as you can see here, page number 15. So I'm just referring to page number 15 here. Okay, just bear with me for one extra one or two extra minutes. We'll just wrap up this transaction that will cover the whole case. I want to cover all the all the questions in the case. Is everyone clear? Yes. Why we went for 
fixed fixed currency swap because we want to remove the currency risk uh, and by going to fixed rate dollars so we can remove the currency risk on both the interest payments and the uh, in principal payments okay rms page number 15 this is the transaction so imagine abc is magma and it has got this underlying exposure imaginary which we are drawing here fixed rate aussie dollars fixed rate aussie dollars is going out here okay both p and i okay and so fixed rate is for the i and then the p is there as well so what you do is you do a swap in which we have to change these names this should be fixed rate aussie dollars you will receive fixed rate aussie dollars and you will be paying fixed rate us dollars yes so net fixed rate aussie dollar fixed rate aussie dollar here will cancel this is imaginary that you have a fixed rate aussie dollar loan right so these two will cancel and then you'll be left with a fixed rate us dollars which is fine for you because you're a us dollar based company your revenues are in us dollars no risk left is this clear okay so the answer to question number five 4.3 is that it is fixed fixed currency swap okay so even if you get this uh, you know even if you encounter a situation where uh, we sometimes you might say swap or swap structure because the terms that is used in the industry is swaps okay all right okay so is, have we answered all the questions in the case yes. one two three now you'll obviously say yes <laughs> because time is no 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 everyone is clear yes. okay all right okay so i think i've only taken one minute extra so we are fine no, anybody no. has does anyone have a technical questions yes <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.